Hello, you've caught me breaking the rules because look at me with my plain clothes and no tattoos and uneventful upbringing. I'm a real rebel. Especially when it comes to video games. Mate, I'm off the chain. You can't tell me what to do. Use a manual. Think I've got time for your advice. Health and safety precautions. Pa! I'm a renegade, a maverick, sticking it to the man like the man's Majin Buu and I'm Super Saiyan Goku doing the Kamehameha over and over in training mode. I mean, I'm very naughty really, the rules are for my own good, but I guarantee I'm not alone in choosing to ignore them. Here are seven itty bitty little rules literally every gamer has broken at some point. Number one, reading the license agreement, or the user agreement, or whatever these things at the beginning of games are called, I don't know, I've never read one. These are big old legal documents you have to virtually sign before the game will let you play it. Usually they're grandiose bits of lawyer talk for don't be a douche online, but again, like I said, literally anything could be written in here and I'd agree to it. I just want to play the game. Please carefully read it, yeah whatever, I just want to punch someone. Most videos Video games know full well no one is going to read these and so allow you to check the box and move on in a couple of seconds. They trust us to play fair and not be awful to other players and we trust them to not include any clauses like the player hereby agrees their soul is now the property of very good game soft or whatever the publisher is. However, sometimes games like to troll you a little bit, like Dragon Ball Fighters here. When I first loaded this up, I got to the user agreement page and was all ready to skip through it when I realised, ah, this is one of those ones that makes you scroll through the entire thing really slowly before it lets you press X and move on. <sighs> You do what you like, Dragon Ball Fighters, I'm not reading it. So yeah, if you ever want me to agree to something ridiculous, put it in the user agreement at the start of a video game. I agree with all of them, really strongly and quickly. Number two, sitting the correct distance from the TV. Oh, game manuals, you silly, silly things with your good intentions and concerns for our health. PS1 manuals were my favourite. Stay as far from the television screen as possible. Which, in the PS1 days, basically means sit as far back as the DualShock cable will allow. Have you seen how long these cables are? And do you remember how small your TV was when you had a PS1? I was clearing rubbish out my garage the other day when I came across the TV TV I used to use with my PS2, the SCAR cable dangling tragically out the back like it was still hoping to be plugged in again one day. I thought it was a toy at first, it was pathetically small and I looked at it in disbelief, realising that this was the monitor on which I'd witnessed all of Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, Final Fantasy 10 and 12, Dragon Quest 8, Akami, God of War, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. I'm getting distracted. My point is, if you sat an entire cable's length away from that, you'd effectively be playing games on a postage stamp. Nowadays, most TVs are the size of pool tables and most living rooms the size of medium to large cupboards, so that helpful advice to sit as far from the TV screen as possible doesn't really count for much anymore. And to be fair, even if I lived in a mansion, I'd still sit really close. It's just better, isn't it? Immerse me! Number three, take a 15 minute break after every hour of play. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here is how my schedule went when I was at my gaming peak during my university years. 3pm, wake up. Have breakfast of peppered steak slice and Dr Pepper while waiting for game to load. 3.15pm to 5am, play games. Stopping only to go to the bathroom and get more snacks. 5am to 6am, frantically write 1500 word essay that's due in 3 hours. 6am, sleep. 10am, realise I've overslept and run to campus begging them to accept my essay one hour after deadline. Yes, maybe you should take a 15 minute break every so often. Anyway, 11am, play more games. 
Number four, you must play in a well-lit room, because what could be better than having the glare of sunlight and tungsten bulbs bouncing off the screen and back into your eyes, obscuring the important stuff, you know, the video games. Here's how I play games, if anyone's interested. Turn off all lights in the room. If it's daylight outside, then draw the curtains. <sighs> Horrible sunlight burns us! Sorry, now it's nice and dark. You can play your video games. Ah, oh, you'll hurt your eyes playing in the duck rubbish. No one tells you that in the cinema, do they? You don't get concerned parents barging into screenings of The Last Jedi, demanding the management flush the theatre with house lights to protect everyone's poor eyes. No, that would be awful. The lovely soft darkness helps to focus your attention and immerse you in whatever you're playing. Also, lots of my gaming was done in the early hours when technically I wasn't supposed to be gaming, so I couldn't very well have the lights on, could I? No, if I was, the room would be brightly lit, wouldn't it? Yes, yes, it was on the wall, off the wall. Number five, read the manual thoroughly before you play. Or nowadays that equates to playing through all the training missions, etc. Because we don't really get manuals anymore. I mean, I used to read the beginning of manuals, the story synopses like this cool one in Vagrant Story, and the character bios like in Final Fantasy VIII here, but the rest of it, you know, the bits that tell you what the controls are. The newly introduced junction system enables the player to change a character. I'll just figure it out as I go along. Who's got time to be told how to play the game? Instead, what I'll do is take even longer than it would have taken me to read the manual, getting things wrong until I eventually learn what I'm supposed to be doing via the medium of constantly making mistakes. That's how I like to learn things. Manuals. Uh. Training missions too, I've got no time for those. Did I play the VR missions in Metal Gear Solid? Yes, but only after I'd actually finished the game and even then it was just for a laugh. Did I bother with any of the training missions in Elite Dangerous? No, I just dived right in and then couldn't move my ship. Yeah, you might actually need to do the training missions in Elite Dangerous. Do you think I bothered with the training missions in Overwatch? Hello, Soldier 76. Shut up, Athena, I know what I'm doing. What am I doing? How about the training missions in any fighting game ever? Again, no. The fighting is the training. Basically, anything that stops me from just playing the game straight away can do one. Entry 6. Paying attention to age ratings. Now come on, hands up who didn't wait until they were 18 to play GTA. I remember back in the PS1 days, before Peggy had come in, and games with naughty things like blood and swearing were classified by the BBFC, exactly like movies. Resident Evil and Dino Crisis and the like all had the big scary 15 stamp on them, which gave these games a sense of forbiddenness that just made them even more exciting. I convinced my dad to get me Dino Crisis when I was about 13 by feeding him some line about them having to give it a 15 rating because of some legal restriction when showing dinosaurs or something. <laughs> My dad was so stupid. Wait, he didn't believe me, did he? I especially enjoyed how cool I felt going into school, telling everyone I'd got past that scary bit where the T-Rex smashes through the window, because that was where the free demo you got with the official PlayStation magazine ended, and that I was now well into the game, the game rated 15, Wow! All my friends must have thought, Rob, you're so cool! <laughs> my friends were so stupid. They didn't think I was cool, did they? But of course, the one every kid wants to get their hands on is GTA. Vice City was the hot currency among my friends. How many hours have you played? 20? Cool. How about you? 40? Wow! Cool, 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 cool! I wasn't allowed a copy and had to go round to my friend's house to play it. He let me borrow it once and I smuggled it home inside the box for a different game. My mum never had a clue. My mum was so stupid. <laughs> enough to believe you were actually playing Thomas and Friends a day at the races? My entire life has been a lie.
Our final entry is something I guarantee no gamer ever does, and that is properly adjusting the brightness levels to the video game's specifications. Adjust this bar until the image on the left is barely visible. How about I do it until it's visible, just visible, okay? Especially you, horror games, trying to hide your jump scares in the blackness. I'm going to brighten the hell out of you, okay? Yeah, so what if my playthrough of Resident Evil 7 looked mostly like this? I could see in the dark, and that's all that matters. Obviously, you don't want to go too overboard and have the image that's supposed to be completely invisible lit up like Times Square, because then you're just going to drown your game in excess light, but I can pretty much guarantee in all the years I've been playing video games, I haven't once adjusted the brightness exactly how the game wants me to. Like I said, I'm a maverick. I don't play by the rules. You can't tell me what to do. Robert, it's half past ten. You've got work tomorrow. All right, right, right. Bye, bye, bye. Subscribe, please subscribe. And tell us in the comments if you've got any more examples you think we've missed, or if any of this rings true for you. Thanks for watching and see you next week for another Friday feature.